Tankards and time to drink them, ordered the king. Servants came, poured the three men ale, and left them. Well now, said Argius, after half their tankards had been drained, getting caught up as old friends do. Simon said that he has news of great import for Asgillon, and that you should be here to hear it. I have grave news for you, for your house and for all of Asgillon, began Simon. Daniel, have you heard of the guild of wealthy men who call themselves the Builders? Yes, nodded Daniel. They are the heads of the wealthiest houses in Asgillon and the Unicorn Kingdoms. You have spoken truly, but not completely. They had many of the wealthiest houses, too, but more importantly, they had the oldest of the houses of wealth. They are owners of mercantile exchanges, banking houses, makers of the apocryphal powders that physicians use, and many other things. They have become kings in their own way, for their treasuries, though lesser than their realms, are ruled by fewer men, and therefore more focused and thus have a greater ability to accomplish the things those men set out to accomplish. With their wealth they build up men who agree with their goals and tear down men who would hinder them. They have no army, yet many powerful men heed their call, senators and centurions, magistrates and ministers, priests and patriarchs. Many who would rise to high office and, having risen, remain there, come to the Builder's Guild seeking its favour, and favour is given, but not without a price. Just a hint here, a suggestion there, then a demand, and finally, when they have their victims addicted to their aid, a command. Do as we order, or the gold you need to remain where you are shall disappear. And ever it has been thus, from the founding of the first city upon the earth, said Argius. Only the king is not beholden to such men for our office, but even the crown feels their power. For the Builders' Guild and the men like them control many in the High Senate, and it is the Senate which controls the treasury of this land. And yet, said Simon, even the High Senate knows it must please the people of Asgillon to keep their seats. With those seats, the keys to that treasury. Therefore, they do not do all that, that the Builders bid them do, at least not openly or quickly. Instead... The Senate is ever trying to strike a balance between pleasing those who elect them and pleasing those who fund the election. Agilon's freedom has depended on that balance of forces for many years. But the Builders' Guild now has a plan to upset that balance, to lay a subtle snare for the people of this land, and once that snare is tight around their necks, bring them under a cruel enslavement. Simon took a deep breath and looked skyward as if in silent prayer before continuing. King Argius, here then is the danger that I would speak to you of. The Builders' Guild, these uncrowned kings of wealth, may not sit openly upon the throne here in Asgillon, but they have other ways to rule. In the unicorn kingdoms across the sea, when they have not attained the crown outright, they rule from behind the throne as firmly as if they did sit upon it. They mean to do the same in Asgillon, but first the people must be lulled into a dependency on them. They have begun such a task in Unicornia, starting in Gaul. There all the people are given a tattoo that bears their census number. The people of Gaul carry no silver or gold, but when making a purchase... Show the tattoo to the merchant, and the amount is taken from the purchaser's banking house and transferred to that of the seller. Argius's eyebrows knit together as he heard this. But how can this work? How can a merchant know the amount in a man's account just from seeing a tattoo? He cannot send a runner to the banking house each time a purchase is made. The method you describe would be like taking a letter of script from a stranger. No merchant would conduct business that way. The guild has found a way to do this. Though this was not their own doing, for they had help from dark places. To answer your question more directly, at each merchant's store is a black box, hexagonal in shape, with a round window set in the top and about half a cubit in diameter. When a customer's hand is placed atop the box, something within it reads the number of the tattoo. 
This information is then sent quick as thought itself to a similar box at the banking house of both the customer and the merchant. Taking the amount of the purchase from the account of the customer and transferring it to that of the merchant. Surprise and more than a little wonder showed on the king's face. Though these boxes are strange, they seem a boon rather than a cause for alarm, said Argius. No cut purse could take your money unless he wanted to cut off your hand and try to buy something by passing that bloody piece of meat over these boxes. The problem is threefold, began Simon, with each succeeding danger leading to the next. First, though the guild would claim that they have invented a device to make this type of communication possible, there is nothing in these boxes but trinkets, a few mirrors and lenses, a small brass bell, and some tiles made of coloured glass. Things to fool the simple should a box be broken open. No, the secret of the boxes comes from the dark arts, from sorcerers whom the guild is in league with. Second, in Gaul the king has forbidden the use of gold, silver, or copper coin in that realm. The only way to buy or sell is through the black boxes and the tattoos. And last, the guild knows that many people will not take a mark upon their bodies. Therefore, their plan is to begin with this. With that, he laid a thick bronze medallion on the table. The banking houses will use these first, as a test of the black box system. People will wear these medallions and use them in place of the mark on their hand which the men of Builders' Guild hope will prepare them for the eventual use of that mark. Look at the medallion. I was told that the three numbers at its centre are always the same. The king picked up the medallion and examined it. A puzzled look came over his face. What is it, father? asked Daniel. Look at this and tell me what you see, replied the king, handing his son the medallion. Daniel felt its weight in his hand. Not a small amount of bronze was used in its manufacture. It was about a third larger than a gold sovereign, the largest coin used in Azulon. The medallion had a small hole set near the edge. He supposed this was for a cord, so that the piece could be worn hung from the neck, though its weight would make it cumbersome to do so. The side of the medallion facing him had a broad gouge running across it, obscuring whatever design was intended to be shown there. So he turned the medallion over, and on this side... There was an imprint, and the sight of it caught his breath in his throat. Three hexagons, descending in size, and each set within the other. Within each hexagon were six numbers, so that there were three sets of six numbers. At the centre of the smallest hexagon were three numbers, six, six, and six. The numbers were written in old northern runes, little used now, perhaps as a way to hide their meaning. It is the trihex, said Daniel, placing the medallion down on the table and pushing it away from him. Why would they choose such a symbol? Yes, why indeed? Why choose a symbol that for all those who worship the one God through his son Yeshua is a symbol of the greatest evil that will ever walk among men? Why? because the knowledge that the Builder's Guild uses to power these black boxes comes from the servants of that very same evil. Who? Daniel asked, 